says, get that India, big boy. Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Tip Sheet Podcast. As always, I'm your host, John, also known as 4020, joining me to talk everything NRL news and Parramatta after another big week of the NRL. I'm a good mate, 60s and Quint. Fellas, always a pleasure to have you on the show. How are you doing on this rather brisk Tuesday night? Oh, mate, isn't it cold? Uh, isn't it supposed to get down to zero out here in the Golden West? I, I think you might be flirting with the, the permafrost on the floor, yeah. Mate, it's... Look, every time I think it's cold, I, I just think back to the childhood and there were frosts on the grass most mornings in winter. So I don't think it's any colder or any hotter than it was when I was a kid. So, um, you know, I guess this comes with the territory. There, it, it's called winter for yeah, a the, reason. The bones are a little bit older, which means the, the cold gets a little bit deeper and, and bitier. But yes, you're right. <laughs> but, well... There you are. You're throwing an old joke at me. Hey, I, early in the podcast, mate. That, 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 that applies for all of us, mate. I, I tell you uh, what. I, I will add that I, I do regularly have to squeak up my knees and elbows just to uh, <laughs> get moving. So, you know, I'm certainly getting up the stairs at, um, at Combank Stadium to uh, uh, test out my body these days. Yeah, well, well, they don't call me 60s <laughs> now, just as a casual name. <laughs> <laughs> No. Yes, it is. <laughs> the, uh, the, the age and the name are aligning, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I had nothing to do with the cold, but I had a, a bout of plantar fasciitis last week. And, to, you know, when you're a kid, you never get that stuff and get in the wrong side of 30 now, and suddenly the body's letting you know. So, uh, yeah, it's not just the cold, mate. It's not just the, the old bones there. We're all, we're all doing it tough. But, Quint, how you doing, mate? Yeah, well, you know, if we're, if we're going to share our ailments and speaking that other, other side of 30, yep, definitely in that uh, use it or lose it territory myself. <laughs> so um, I try to keep myself as, uh, as active as possible. <laughs> but, you know, the thing, that, um, the thing that, that, that's, that's kept me most active this past weekend is the great result we had on the mm-hmm. weekend. And, um, you know, I normally get to, um, I get to share the company of both of you, you lovely gentlemen, um, in um in in Combank Stadium yeah, each home game, but someone um, someone was part of the bit, bourgeois uh, on the weekend. Yeah. So, and, and so so um so Forty and I were a party of two, and um, there's some definitely some 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 funny moments throughout the game um, <laughs> as we watched it, and a, a highlight I might touch on later. But sixties, uh, your your mantle, your curse mantle, may have been handed over during the course of this match. <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course, I was occupying your seat and. Bailey's been having such a great run, and at that point I was like, yeah, the whole back one's been so good for a month now, and Bailey Simonson's really come alive at left centre. Played a ball error. So, it, yeah. And, and, and that, that, that happened within about three seconds, maybe less, of 40 finishing that sentence. Maybe it had to do with which side of the ground I was sitting on this <laughs> weekend, because I'm going to refer you both to my tip in the preview this week. So the tip of... Jermaine Hopgood to score a try in an Eels win at the odds of seven dollars. Yes, yes, <laughs> and, and at least one reader did follow that and put the put the punt on. So I'm happy. I'm happy for that this, person. This so. is a two place swing here now. <laughs> are, are we in curses lifted territory? <laughs> it's uh, the bizarre, sage has been think. burnt. Exactly. <laughs> All right, boys. Before we yeah, get, I'm, in... I'm waiting. I'm waiting for Feldman from across the hall to join the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, but before we get into the NRL news, quick shout out to the sponsors of the show: uh, Big Swing Golf, North Mead, and then Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn, Narellon, and Parramatta, uh, making it happen each and every episode. All right, boys. I'm going to hand over the sixties, but not before we hit the stinger. Well, fellas, let's start off with a bit of news that we were hinting at in previous podcasts that was probably coming up, which is the retirement of Mitch Rain. 
he's announced it officially on his social media. We've been talking about how he hadn't been named in any Eels grade for some time. Uh, nothing mentioned in the injury reports. So he's indicated that he was taking a bit of time to himself just to recharge the batteries, and now he's decided that it's the time is right to hang the boots up. Uh, your thoughts, John? Yeah, not not too big a surprise. He's had a lot of uh, wear in the tyres. He's been through a number of clubs and played a lot of football. Uh, I mean, a shockingly, shockingly large amount of football, honestly. He's ten, tenure at the uh, Titans and Panthers, I think, in particular, and, and the Dragons, too, netted him a lot of NRL caps, and he carved out a pretty handy career at the Eels. You know, he just didn't really... Uh, not like he didn't have a place. The opportunity just never really came. He got a few caps of us, and then uh, saw himself getting uh, supplanted by Brendan Hands this year with the young rookie really, you know, coming to life. And, yeah, I think the right time to make the right call, and well done to him on a, on a very good NRL career. He can certainly retire knowing that he achieved plenty in the game. Yeah, Clint? Well, it, it, it's a great career that he, that he had, you know, getting over 200 L, NRL games is... Um, it's not something to um, to stick your nose up at. That's 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 a pretty good NRL career, and you know, forty touched on. He had a number of clubs there, so um, he pr- will probably be remembered as a St George Illawarra player. That's where he played the majority of his football, and probably his best football as well. You know, getting a couple of call ups in New South Wales country there, but you know, he um, it, it would have been interesting um, to have, have seen him play a, a, a couple more NRL games with us. But as forty touched on, it just didn't didn't just eventuate that way um, for a number of cir- uh, circumstances and reasons and you know, largely with the way that we were playing with Reid Marnie in, in the hooking role last year and and the emergence of Brendan Hands. Yeah, and as you mentioned before, 200 NRL games, that's not too shabby by anyone's standard. I think a lot of players are, are happy to uh, get to 50 or 100 NRL games once you start to hit milestones like the double century then you're talking about a really decent career and uh what have we heard before in the past about what the average nrl career is it's like some absurdly small number mm-hmm. of games it's oh, i think it's is I think it, it's under 40 or something maybe like 36 games or, or 40 games something to that effect yeah so when when you're talking about someone that's played the number of games that mitch rain has then you know kudos to him and probably making the right decision if you I, I guess when you're at the end of your career you know it and he obviously does and he's made that call and now he gets to move on with uh, post football career from here on in now the next piece of news is uh, also about a player that joined the Eels from another club and that's Joe off in Galway he's opened up about well, not exactly the full details about what happened with his departure from the West Tigers, but he's probably opened up about his feelings regarding it. John? Yeah, he you know, he was uh, quite candid with the media, saying that he didn't want to leave. Um, he, he wouldn't go into the details, like you said, but he, he didn't want to leave the club. And it's kind of shocking, really, isn't it, that the Tigers would actively part way with a, a quality player that wants to be a cornerstone of the rebuild there. I mean, he was their player of the year last year, has been an origin rep in recent seasons. Uh, he seems like a no-brainer to want to turn this club around with, but for whatever reason, he's now an eel. And yeah, the the Tigers have made a rather head-scratching decision, it must be said. Yeah, Clint, your thoughts? Well, head-scratching decisions is not foreign territory for the Tigers, unfortunately. Well, fortunately for us, because we picked up a really good Quality play and Joe and Gowie to join us, and I couldn't be happier that he's with us. You know, he's he's the type of middle forward that really balances out the style of player or archetype of player within our squad. Um, I'm I'm really happy that you know unfortunate circumstances and you know uh, again as Forty touched on a, a head scratcher, but you know you'd have to suggest that this was financially motivated or salary cap motivated from the Tigers' end, and we're the beneficiaries. And I'm really glad that he's with us. Yeah, absolutely. And from what I saw at training the other week and also today, he's really bought into being part of the Eels structure there. Um, he's 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 really um, he's there. He's there as a leader, I think, even though he's new. I think he's got some real leadership qualities. He last week's session, he he spent a bit of time talking to Luca Moretti 
and uh, pump it up the fellas about their line speed and um, aggression in defence, getting off the line. So, look, I think he's going to be a great addition to the club and certainly he's, given his experience, you expect him to be that way, wouldn't you? So, um, yeah, moving on, however, from the present to the past... On Saturday, we saw the past champions from the Parramatta Eels honoured with long overdue premiership rings for those premierships in the 1980s. John, we uh, we had David Lydiard come and join mm-hmm. us quite uh, impromptu in the uh, in the tip sheet podcast in Jack's Bar and Grill after the game. Um, you were uh, both you and Clint. Uh, Far too young to have seen the <laughs> premiership wins in the 1980s. But uh, how did you feel about that honour being bestowed upon the players and, yeah. and what you saw of their responses? Really classy move by the club. Um, you know, I think Mal Meninga was on. We went. We didn't see it live 60s because we were doing the post game. But when I got home, I was having a chat to the family. That I think Mal was mentioning how even he didn't have premiership rings from those titles that he won for Canberra in the 90s. And, yeah, just giving, giving back to those players, those teams that made such important history for the club and bringing them together to celebrate is a, a really great thing to do. And, yeah, the rings are really nice. It, it was a really good touch. And, you know, the fact that they started this, hopefully they can see it through for all the premiership winning teams now, but a really, really great initiative from the club and a wonderful day, uh, you know, from the presentation pre-game to having all the old boys filtering into the uh, the club and Jack's Bar and Grill in the post-game and just interacting with fans. Again, we, we can't speak highly enough of this playing group from that period of time, 60s. They are just a wonderful band of our former players and gentlemen. Yeah, it, look, it was. it's always a buzz to have one of those players come and join us in the podcast, and, and we know just how giving of their time they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mentioned uh, David just getting up uh, quite impromptu and uh, coming over and, and joining us there, and um, it was... I mean, that was an honour then... Um, we had the likes of uh, Stan Jurd, Graham Atkins, Mark Laurie, Steve Ella, um, Neil Hunt, John Muggleton, mm-hmm. uh, Terry Leebeater. I'm trying to I'm trying to recall as many as I can that were out there on the balcony at Jack's Bar and Grill afterwards. But uh, it was it was great to be able to go out there and and have a few words to. Each of them I got to see one of the premiership rings up close. Stan Jurd was it was probably one of the this is this is how I I judge how well received the this honour was uh, by the uh, from the players is that one of the first things that um, happened when I went outside onto the balcony was um, stopped to talk to Stan Jurd and Graham Mackins and Stan was very quick to show the premiership. <laughs> And and you just could see, you could just see like how how stoked he was to, yeah, to awesome. be able to have that. Yep. And um, and look, it was I, I you know I, I probably could have spoken to them all night, but it was their night. <laughs> you know, you have to. Yeah, I. I have to be careful that I don't go into big fanboy moments of you know the the <laughs> Premiership winning players there of uh, from my youth watching the games uh, watching the teams win premierships Eels teams winning premierships boys that's one thing that I've got over here too fellas is I'm old enough <laughs> to have seen that happen so yeah all we've got is heartbreak <laughs> <laughs> but uh, oh. no look it was it was a real buzz and. Um, and uh, yeah, w- one of the interesting things was I was trying to recall uh, Stan Jurd's try playing for uh, the Eels against Manly at Brookvale Oval. And he made sure that he, he gave me literally a blow-by-blow account of how the try <laughs> was scored. And I guess when he uh, Stan scored, he informed me he scored something like six tries in 120-something NRL games, so I, I guess you would know exactly what transpired in each of those six tries. It'd be a bit different to uh, someone like I don't know Luke Bird or Brett Kenny recounting one of their tries, their hundred and something plus tries. So um, yeah, no, that was that was really good. I enjoyed 
the fact that they were back at the club after the game. And, you know, that's the that's the great thing about the uh, the former players is that when they're back at the club after the game, they will mix with the fans and in, they actually enjoy mixing with supporters. So, uh, it, yeah, it was, it was a terrific night. Um, Clint, as I mentioned before, you're a bit, you're a bit too young to have seen any of these premiership players in action, but uh, your takes on the, the Eels uh, presenting them with premiership rings. Well, you, you, you've opened him up today, John, because um, that's, that's twice he's made mention of that to us. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm putting this squarely on your shoulders. I'm absorbing my involvement in, in this one. We've got we to we gotta, we gotta settle, uh, settle this score very quickly. And yes, I'll acknowledge the, heart, the, heart, the heartbreak lingers strong with both, yeah. uh, both John and I having not seen a premiership we, in our we, lifetime. We've we got all, all the fun of 01, 05, 09, 2022. Yeah, uh, yeah that's... Our, our lot right yeah. now, but we'll, we'll, I, we'll, I, we'll, I, I, we'll put this one in the bank well. 60s. Don't you worry, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Just remember, I went through the pain of 76 True. and 77 yeah. Before, yeah. before the, the joy of that time. Yes, <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> um, 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 classy was the word that John used earlier, and it was uh, that's absolutely what, what it is from start to finish. You know, I, th- I think it was a real great way to, to, to recognize some of the Legends is the word that gets thrown around so often, but you know, and you know, I, I don't want to um, to undersell uh, Michael Cronin standing in the club as the as the sole champion of Paramount. But these these, these are champion players and, and ch- that that made up champion teams, um, you know, in, in in every sense of the word. So to see them honoured in such a way is befitting of um, their achievements and the standing in which they're held within the club. But you know, in, interesting that you had a, um, had a good yarn with, with Stan. I've, I've, um, I've, I used to play football with one of Stan's sons and um, dad also used to um, know, know, know this, um, the, the, the uh, son that he played football with as well. And because he had such a good relationship with dad, um, he was big G and I was baby G. Um, Stan used to always refer, refer to me too, which, you know, as a as a as a sixteen year old kid playing football, you didn't really appreciate that type of nickname. But when it comes from someone from the standing of um, of Stan Jurd, you um you cop it on the chin with a smile on your face. Um, yeah. And you know, it's, it's, good to, it's good to hear that he's 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 still he's still got all those stories. You know, he's 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 got a lot of great memories, as do all, all of um, our Premiership winners. And you know, you you, you chat to any of them, they're they're really saw all soul of the earth people who when you measure the you know if if they were people who had achieved what they'd achieved um in the modern era there's not a chance in hell that they would make themselves as accessible and and be as um as as forthcoming with their time and and conversationally as they are with um the wider parameter faithful as as this era of of players and, and champion players are so, you know, it, it's great to hear that this was put on. This honor was put on for them, but you know, it's not surprising to hear the way in which they were with the fans and and have continued to be since day dot. You know, the, 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 these are the people who made up our club. Yeah, I believe that the inside of the of the rings also had their names inscribed as well. And John was I, was I imagining this with was uh, David Lydiard talking about. How his wife had laid claim to the ring, already. Uh, perhaps I'm, I'm, that one's a little bit hazy for me, so I'll trust that you got that one right. <laughs> well, I, I, well, if it wasn't David, it was one of the other players. So, um, anyway, moving on. Of course, that was that was like the icing on the cake of a great day with the Eels take uh, claiming uh, a huge victory over the Manly Seagulls. Final takes on that match, fellas. I'm going to start throw it to you first, Clint. Your final takes on that match. Yeah, any time that you beat Manly is a great day. It's a great game, <laughs> um, but you know, even more so when you consider the players that weren't available for us. And when you, when you, um, you know, I don't think any of us would have if you propositioned us. You're going to have um, you're going to score um, over thirty points against Manly. Um, missing both your starting halves. Would you take that? <laughs> yes, every day of the week and twice on Sunday. So, 
you know, from from um, a result perspective, it was absolutely fantastic to come out 30 point victors. Um, it was really, really pleasing to only concede the one try. We, we controlled field positions so well in that game. And, you know, I'm, I'm not fussed by the amount of tackles that we had inside their 20, inside their red zone, um, given both our first choice halves were unavailable for the game. But, um, you know, it, it was really, really pleasing to, as a team result, to get that, as well as some really nice individual moments. Obviously, Jermaine Hopgood scored a really good individual try. Um, you know, we joked earlier um, about the form of Bailey Simonson and and um, and Forty putting the mocker on him in that play the ball scenario. And you know, a, a nice way to finish off the match as well with um, you know, a little bit of a fluky, but all albeit. Um, Entertaining, nonetheless, um, try for Makahesi Makatoa to, to get off his NRL duck. No, look, I'm going to. I have to correct you there, as I've tried to do so on social media. It's not a fluke if they practice that at training. They call the move the Big Macca with chips. So. <laughs> 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 uh, but John, your uh, your thoughts on the game? Yeah, it must have been such a cathartic response for Brad at the end of that game to lay out a game plan minus your best playmaker, minus your, uh, not just your best playmaker, but minus your two frontline playmakers, by the way. Uh, we're talking about Mitchell Moses being at origin, Dylan Brown still unavailable for selection, minus Junior Barlow still missing a couple of key players in, in terms of injuries with Sean Lane and Wira McGregg. And the team rallies and they just go out there and execute. Uh, I mean, that, that must be what coaching is all about when you're at the highest level, just having your boys buy into, you know, something so not necessarily simple but straightforward and execute so well when you're so down on troops so that was fantastic obviously the Makatoa try was a real highlight uh the big fella I, I mean he was overshadowed on the weekend and we'll get to that later for good reason uh by getting his first ever career try in such a sensational way and I mean the parallels to the other one we'll talk about are actually fascinating because the other one was a real cheapy and this one was a you know a real hustle play so he did very well there um Dejan Arcee stepping up and you know, really taking control of the team, uh, fantastic. The back line continuing to flourish after all those struggles earlier in the season where we had players that didn't look like they were not necessarily up to standard but just weren't playing anywhere near their best and suddenly they found their, you know, not just their feet but they're just excelling. You know, Bowie Simonson looks like Grease Lightning out there. He gets the ball and the opposition are just sweating. So really great to see that. Really great to see all those French forwards stepping up and being uh, fully bought into the next man up philosophy. Yeah, just that, that was a really fun game. Um, they, they went out and executed, and that was everything you wanted to see from this one. Uh, one of the things that I found interesting in the days afterwards is who we, on, by we I mean you and I, not so much overlooked, but maybe didn't give enough credit to in the match. And it's, I'm actually a bit surprised in a way that we didn't, but there's been a lot of praise for Clint Gutherson's performance in the match, and rightly so. Um, I think we we found a lot of the same players that we wanted to congratulate and put in the three two one after the match. Um, but um, yeah, Gutho had he had quite an outstanding game as I guess like the third playmaker mm -hmm. in that in that uh, game. But look, I found it impossible to ignore the claims of Jermaine Hopgood as the absolute best on field. I thought his performance, the, the try that he scored really summed up the threat that he poses to opposition teams because he's got that ball playing ability. He really leaves the opponents in two minds. Is he going to be um, the ball player in a particular move? Is he going to take on the line himself? And because he's, He's got that threat of the opposition not knowing exactly what he's going to do. It makes him really dangerous close to the line. And that that try where he looked like he might be going to send the ball out, then he took on the line himself, palmed away from the first defender and sprinted to the to the line, uh, carrying um, the fullback over the line with him for the try. I, I, thought, I thought his overall performance was outstanding, but I thought that try really summed up what he brings to the Eels' attack, he, in the red, especially in the red zone. He had a very good game against Canterbury too. 18 runs, 150 metres, a couple of tackle breaks, a whole stack of tackles, I think 34, uh, sorry, 33 tackles with a few missed. Uh, but 
it feels like if he had that game that he had against Manly the week before, he would have been really kicking down the Dolph Origin selection, wouldn't he? Like just mm-hmm. the, the stuff he did against Manly where he physically dominated on both sides of the ball, cover saving, try or try saving cover tackles, barnstorming run to the trial line, just really physical play from the middle. Um, you know, it might have been a case of limit just one week too late, which is unfortunate for the big fella, but good for us. Uh, he is he, he started on fire. He had that little slump after that where it was just that adjustment period to NRL playing week in, week out, high level football. And ever since then he just he hasn't looked back. He's been so, so good. And I'll say it every time. It is absurd that Penrith couldn't find a way to get him into their forward rotation at the NRL level. And obviously, the Parramatta's gain. Uh, he is a tremendous young player. He Not only is he a tremendous player, I, I think he'll end up being the Parramatta Reels captain uh, at a point. You know, it might be, you know, four, five years down the track, but I think he will end up being the Parramatta Reels captain. He's, he's just got such um, a, a, a football instinct. And uh, he's he's a great communicator as well. So I think there's a lot of positives to come for Jermaine Hopgood. And let's just enjoy this period where we don't have to worry about losing him to Origin. So <laughs> because I think down the down the track that'll just be a, a a regular season headache for us as losing him for some games, especially if the NRL keep drawing us to play all three games without Origin. <laughs> Um, okay, Team List Tuesday, and uh, again, I'm going to throw it uh, back to you here, Forty, because you've just put up the Team List Tuesday uh, post. Mm-hmm. What the, what's the big news out of, well, each of the grades? Let's start with the Jersey Flag in the under-21s. Uh, it's going to be a tough week, actually, again, for Flag and uh, Reserve Grade boys. They've uh, been doing it tough for a while now, and they've got very good competition in the uh, Cronulla Sharks and Flag level and the Newtown Jets are the Cronulla Sharks at New South Wales Cup level. But in the flag, they're travelling over the Points Bet Stadium on Saturday, which, unfortunately, 60s and Quint, is going to be a real big uh, conflict for uh, anyone that's trying to catch flag, cup, and NRL. Flag is over at Cronulla at 12.30, and then New South Wales Cup and NRL have been run at the same time at 3 o'clock. So yeah, this is another joy of being a para fan this year. Uh, but, yeah, in this team, boys, big news in that Ethan Sanders is back at halfback. He'll partner Josh Lynn in the halves. On the interchange, Matty Arthur has served the two legs of his two-game suspension, so he's back to reinforce the dummy half roll, uh, which means it's a bit of a reshuffle on the back line. Richard Penasini has gone from wing to centre, uh, with Terrell Williams going from centre to wing. Arpa Tidal's back at fullback. And uh, in total, I think if you factor in Paddy Spence as the 18th man, there are now 10 SG ball players in this squad. So really loading up on the young lads here. Uh, Charlie Gomez on a flank, Brock Parker and Noel Reed starting in the front row. Uh, yeah, it's a good-looking team. Um, they've got, obviously, the big man back in Ethan Sanders. He is the key man. Matty Arthur's a very handy inclusion, too, on that uh, interchange bench. But they're taking on the third-place Cronulla Sharks. It's a big game, but uh, they've got some important cattle back. Yeah, and it's it's a pity that there's been the injury disruption, too, isn't there, with the um, with these players that have come up from the SG ball because some of them had injuries to deal with. We've still got Blaze Talungi out with injury. Mm-hmm. If he was available, we'd probably be talking about 11 players. Yeah, without, without a doubt, I think you find place for Blaze in the back line somewhere, whether it's centres or at 584 somewhere. Yeah, that's right. So, um, but yes, it's, it is a tough ask, but all of this time together for these players is going to hold them in good stead for whether they they start in flag next year or whether they in I think in the case of some of them end up starting in New South Wales Cup. Yeah, these are the Wales. these are the lumps they swallow now, the adversity they have to deal with now in order to be better players in the future. So yeah, they might be losing games now, but uh you know, they'll be better for it in the not yeah. not just the future but the near future too. Yeah, Clint. Yeah, look it's it's exactly that, and you know, I think there will be a lot of keen eyes um, on this grade and the result in this grade because um, you know, part of the philosophy that's um, led to Jake Arthur leading the club is creating a pathway for Ethan Sanders to be the uh, the deputy um, to the NRL halves, and you know uh, he's obviously returning from injury from that hand injury. Um, you know, Forty and I were discussing the possibility of. 
of when his elevation to New South Wales Cup will happen. Um, you know, so the club will be looking for him to get through this game and put in a good performance. And, you know, um, Forty and I were deliberating over the weekend with the, the mixed performance of Cup, and we'll get into Cup in, in uh, momentarily. But, um, you know, how soon is too soon in throwing him in there, given the performance of the team? Do you throw him in there in the hope that go, no, he just needs to be exposed to some um, some senior footballers and, and, and playing against men for, for the rest of the year so he's primed and ready to go um, for, a, for a full off-season um, and ready to take charge of that grade next year, you know? Well, um, umming and ahhing about sort of when when you pull the trigger on that, but you know, um, I, I, apart from um, obviously the, the count hitting ten, I think the, the the news story within this grade is the return of Ethan Sanders and hopefully a good performance and and start building that pathway up up to cup. Yeah, I think if he hadn't been out for a month, it may well be that he would have been uh, playing New South Wales Cup at the moment, and that seems like a good segue, John for you to talk about the ins or the significant selections this week in New South Wales Cup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cup boosted by a couple of boys who are unfortunately making way in the NRL squad. Luca Maridi and uh, uh, Matt Dury, sorry, uh, surplus the requirements in NRL, and that's just an unfortunate byproduct of getting more frontline buyers back at the top level. Uh, Those two boys have been fantastic uh, at the NRL level for us for the last month or so, so well done to them. But they come back and boost... New South Wales Cup as they take on the second place Newtown Jets. Ford pack looks very handy. You've got uh, Jonte Jr. Beth and Mesa, who continues to start in the front row, boys. He's doing a very good job. Uh, you talk about taking your lumps and, and sort of rolling up your sleeves. Jonte's doing that and doing it very well. Uh, but he'll be in the front row of Kai Rodwell. Jack Murchie, Matt Dury, Luca Murdy. It's a good back row. Uh, but then the back line. Uh, we finally have a back line that sort of resembles a, a reasonable reserve grade back line, boys. Uh, Isaac Lumilu is on the wing where he belongs. Zach Sini's in the centres where he belongs. Wanga Blake, who I was concerned was going to be out long-term with another right sort of shoulder arm injury. Well, he's being named to play, which is good. He, try, he did train. Yeah, so it looks like it was just a, a bad stinger, uh, which is fantastic. That means that the Eels actually have a bit of depth at centre there. A Hayes Dancer as well, always on the right flank. But the big one for us, boys, Arthur Miller Steve. We've been talking about him for a couple of weeks, wondering when he's going to be back, because he did talk to us on that Easter long weekend and gave us a time frame that sort of planted him hereabouts, and here he is. Uh, AMS back at fullback, really keen to see how he goes because he was really tearing it up at this level uh, when he played here earlier in the season, about three or so games uh, before he hurt that shoulder. Uh, and yeah, the, the team has a, a much better balance to it. The only real glaring selection now, and again, this isn't an indictment on the player because Dan Keir gives it his all every week, uh, but the big man still at 5'8", as the Eels sort of wait for Dejan Arce to hopefully filter back to reserve grade uh, with once Dylan Brown is... Uh, not cleared, but uh, whatever compromise or uh, result comes from his uh, pending case. But it, it is a big ask, isn't it, Clint, to be taking on the Jets this weekend? Well, we watched this side play the Jets earlier in the season at Combate Stadium as the curtain raiser to um, the, the uh, uh, NRL game against the Sharks. And um, they were... Very, very impressive that day of the Jets. Um, and they some outside backs um, within that side um, with a lot of speed that were creating a lot of problems and havoc for, for, for our boys that day. And, you know, it's good to see those um, reinforcements come in. This is a grade that has been struggling in recent times. And, you know, there's um, the departure of Jake Arthur from this side has certainly um, made the playmaking ranks a lot more challenging, and then uh, the subsequent elevation of Dijan Arce to, to first grade, which has already been documented. Um, you know, there's, there's 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 a lot of onus and pressure put on Jordan Rankin there as the uh, as the sole playmaker um, and sole experienced playmaker within this side. But you know, um, you'd be looking with some of those um, forward reinforcements for this game to be played. You know. I, I think the, the manner in which the NRL side won against Manly in the weekend is probably the blueprint for the New South Wales Cup side for the rest of the year, given the players that can slash will be available to them. That's just to, to play a high completion um, game of rugby league through the middle as much as possible and and then um, you know, look to uh, um, uh, unlock some of those um, the spaces in Blake and, and Cine and, and Lumi Lumi and, and AMS. Yeah, John and I will be going into a, a a deeper dive into the preview podcast when we look at this Granola 
slash jet side, and it's certainly got abundant talent out in the back line. There's players running around in reserve grade for Cronulla that would be first grade players in a number of other clubs. But uh, John, just going now from uh, the New South Wales Cup to the NRL team, the uh, big big inclusions this week. Yeah, not as many inclusions as maybe some fans would have been hoping for. Uh, Sean Lane still not named to be part of the top 17. No Josh Hodgson either. Uh, but we do have a couple of begins of uh, Brad Arthur expecting uh, his two origin players to back up with the, uh, what was it, three nights of sleep, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night uh, from origin. So Junior and Mitch named to start. No surprises there. Uh, but beyond that, Brennan Hands will play the uh, full 80 at dummy half, unchanged back line. That one to five has been so good uh, for, what, five, six weeks now, boys? Uh, yep. And going beyond mm. that, <clears throat> Bryce Cartwright, Andrew Davey, they're going to start on the edges as they have for the last few weeks. Ryan Madison going back to the interchange, and that is a beefy bench, boys. Ogden, Ofengahi, Madison, Makatoa, uh, four very big, powerful forwards there. Uh, but we got Dunster, Dory, Moretti, Blake, and Lane on the extended roster. The club did mention again on their team was post that Sean Lane will be a chance to play this week. Uh, be interesting to monitor that situation, given that we do have the bye coming up and the luxury of giving essentially another two weeks to get back to full fitness, and given that the forward pack's playing very well. Uh, but yeah, the, the Eels team really starting to take shape now. The biggest gap... Uh, really, I know Sean Lane and Wirren Rua are significant players in this roster and they will be uh, you know, very important ins, but uh, Dylan Brown, the big missing sort of starter right now, but Dejan Arce doing such a wonderful job in the halves has certainly alleviated some of the uh, significance of that loss. He's done such a good job for us. Uh, Clint, would you be rushing Sean Lane back now or would you go for the match after the bye? I don't see any advantage in, in rushing him back for this with, with the buy coming up, you know. Um, obviously, the club has um, a, a team of physios and the, the head of performance who manages loads and, and will make the right decision based on that data and information. Um, you know, so we, 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 we leave it within their, their trusted hands. However, you know, if, if it was solely up to me, it's not something that I... I I would worry about rushing, particularly given the form of our um, of our forwards uh, and and the team in general the um, the last month or so. So you know, I I don't think there's anything to be um, gained, or I should say, there's nothing to be lost in leaving it for another week and just having him be settled, um, you know, with the um, training with the team and getting um, proper proper week and a half of training through the bye week and then ready to come back and hit the ground running um, uh, after the bye. Yeah, I think that's probably the way to go. Uh, look, I did catch a bit of training today. And what I will say is the positive vibe in the team is uh, palpable. And obviously, when you're winning, that's basically <laughs> the the outcome, isn't it? Uh, players love to get to training. They love to be in each other's company. Uh, they enjoy what they're doing out there on the training track and that's pretty much what I was witnessing uh, today up at Kellyville. Uh, just now moving away from uh, the Eels NRL, a little bit of news in the WNRL space because development contract player Lindsay Tui, who was outstanding at centre for the Eels in the Tasha Gale Cup this year and has earned herself, as I said, that development contract with the Eels NRLW team has just been named in the New South Wales under-19 origin squad. That's uh, that's tremendous news for her. John, I know you're a, a big fan of her work. Yeah, she was tremendous. Season. Yeah, I think she ended up, what, she picked up Players Player and Best and Fairest, I think, at the awards night as well, and that was no surprise. Uh, she was very, very good playing centre out in the backs for the Eels, uh, Fluid runner, powerful for contact, always involving herself. Uh, you know, you could see why they wanted her on an NRLW development contract and equally so why she picked up selection in a season where uh, the team has been dominated, understandably so, by the Bulldogs and uh, the Roosters, I believe. Um, and to force her way into that lineup with the calibre of opposition players that were pushing for selection speaks volumes to her talent. So well done there, Lindsay. 
Yeah, anything you'd like to add there, Clint? Uh, look, you know, it's it's just again pointing to the strength of our development programs, you know, and you, you'd imagine it's just a matter of time that Lindsay joins Ruby Jean Kennard and being the second full um, system player in, um, in 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 the women's side of the game. So, congratulations, Lindsay. Um, we wish you all the best and let's go out there and get them. Yes, uh, and it's uh, we. Who knows? It might even be Rosemary Beckett. Might be one of the. Uh, uh, another one that might debut in the NRLW mm-hmm. this season. And uh, we've also got it was uh, Talara Bamblett as the, another one of the uh, development contract players. Is that right, From John? this year, yes. And uh, I believe last year, uh, was it Rosemary, was it Petalina Otoa? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, yeah, I'd, ha- I'd have to go back and double check. But I, I've, I've, I've got a feeling that that was the case. So, yeah, a couple of the girls had that experience of being uh, part of the extended squad for the NRLW but what you've got now with this is that uh, you've when you start to see the uh, Lisa Fiola uh, Cup players who would then see okay we can progress to Tasha Gale within the Eels Club we can progress to perhaps getting development contracts with the NRLW team, um, staying in this pathway. Um, I think you'll... Look, I'm I'm not going to be surprised if there's a development within the club in terms of filling in that missing gap between the Tasha Gale and NRLW. I'm sure... uh, Let's just watch this space, but I think there might be something on the horizon there as well, just to fill in the pathways a little bit more in the uh, female space at the club. And but look, fellas, yes. I was going to say, just to clarify, from the 2022 NRLW Development Squad, you had Rosemary Beckett, Petalina Toa, Patessa Leo, and Tawisha Maver. So they're, yes. they're, they're still, I suppose, in calculations for NRLW for Parramatta Eels. Yes. Um, and that wraps up now the Eels side of the news podcast. But there's plenty going on in the NRL. And leading that off... When you know it's St George again, and it's Ben Hunt wanting out and wanting out now, and it's look, I think it's quite extraordinary when you've got players that are agitating or their manager are, are agitating publicly that they want out of a club that they are contracted to and contracted to for uh, how many how many more years has he got at the club? I think it's are another they, two. Yeah, so he's he's a strategic um, inclusion in their squad for years to come, and the pressure's being applied publicly on the Dragons to release him. I mean, it's when they no, start to agitate. If you've got if you've got a player or their or their player agent agitating so publicly, does it make the situation untenable? Does it does it does it force the club to release them, Clint? Well, it's certainly the angle that they're trying to work toward. But, you know, we're not just talking about any player here. This is their marquee player, their captain, um, someone who's well um, well um, a part of the representative fixtures for both Queensland and Australia. This is, this is pretty big news. Um, you know, he, he, he would be the, the, the face of their club and a lot of their marketing material that's put out to their fans. You know, again, spare another thought for St. George fans this year and, and, have, and you know, having their, their, their club captain turn and say, you know, will suggest I don't want to be here anymore. You know, what kind of message does that send about the, the future direction of the club, given everything else that they've, um, they've gone through and experienced over the last couple of years? So, you know, it's... Uh, it, it, it's a common angle that's played um, from player managers. And look, these types of conversations, um, when a player is agitated, happens all the happens all the time um, in in rugby league. And I'm not suggesting it happens all the time in terms of the volume of players, but you know, um, if the, what, the 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 strategy is what I'm suggesting in terms of angling for releases. You know, is is what's common when it comes to these scenarios, and. Um, you know, it, 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 it's it's sort of who blinks first. You know, the St. George blinks first, as Ben Hunt blinks first, or Ben Hunt's management blinks first. 
Um, you know, but the longer it goes on, the worse that it is for the St. George Club. Yeah, 40? Yeah, it's uh, one of those sort of no-win outcomes for St. George, is it? And it's probably something that the clubs will be, I know that the CBA hasn't been finalised, but in the coming years heading into the next CBA, we might see a move from the 16 or 18 or 20, sorry, 17, 18 or 20, depending on how expansion goes at the time, clubs to sort of ratify some safeguard for clubs now with uh, player empowerment reaching critical levels and, and players often forcing their way out, marquee players forcing their way out, young stars forcing their way their way out. Uh, we just saw Carlo Wapu, obviously, with the Broncos go to Canterbury. Now we're seeing Ben Hunt uh, doing something similar. Uh, clubs are going to want to ratify something that can protect them or at least safeguard them in some way to get compensation back uh, because, yeah, they're, yes, the Dragons, obviously, they're a, a, you know, a mess. There's no pretty way of uh, painting that picture. They are an absolute shambles. And you can understand why Ben Hunt would want to go chase a ring potentially elsewhere because I can't think money is the issue. He's getting top-of-the-market rates at the Dragons. But then again, when you hear him link to the likes of the Titans and the Bulldogs, um, unless it's another suitor that he's interested in that doesn't really hold sort of a you know, past master, doesn't it? Because he's not going to be winning... Uh, well, not to say he couldn't, but realistically that he wouldn't be a good chance of winning a premiership with either of those clubs in the near future. So, yeah, there's... I don't know. I, I don't know what to make of this. Yeah, like, Dragons, yes, they're a mess, but they also hold his contract rights for the next two seasons. Uh, it'd be very frustrating for him to have to let him go without compensation. And even if they did get compensation, like, what are you going to get that's going to be better than Ben Hunt? You know, he's one of the top-line playmakers. But, but, boys, what do you do if you're St. George? Do you make him stay? Well, that's that, again, that's, it's a no-win situation. You keep him... And he can, depending on the character of the man himself, so I'm not going to you know, pass judgment on Ben for what he would do in that scenario, but theoretically, you know, he could just, you know, phone it in. I mean, he could get injured. You know, he could, uh, and I obviously, you know, the air commas right there, injured. There's a very little recourse the club has now. Uh, and that's why, like I said, the, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a shift in the CBA that follows this one where clubs look to institute something to at least give them some safeguard from this because, yeah, right now it's uh, firmly... It's not, not to say the clubs can't get away with stuff to their advantage, but I feel like the needle has moved strongly towards the players now. Yeah, oh, look, we've seen plenty of times in the past where a player has signed a contract for the future years to go to another club and then you start to see a little bit of agitation for an early release. And um, sometimes the club's hold strong and keep them there at the club for the uh, the rest of the season. Sometimes the clubs decide, you know what, we'll just we'll just part ways now. But once you start to get into this very public agitation for uh, a termination of his contract or for a, a parting of the ways, I should say, um, gee, it's it's tough. But how much is it? How much is it the the player and the agent really pushing hard, and how much is it the media grabbing hold of what's going on and actually exacerbating the whole situation? Well, that's definitely a chicken and egg argument, and how long's a piece of string? Because you know, without um, the full context and knowing the full details, we can only speculate, which is what we're all doing here at the moment. Um, but you know, the, what what might be somewhat um, you know, a, a settling for St. George fans is there is an ex a more recent example in previous years of a situation like this doing a 180 with Payne Haas at the Broncos, who was originally agitating for a release and then um, later changed his mind. And, you know, I, I, I think um, throughout the course of this year, they've been, they've continued talking, um, certainly from the Broncos um, hierarchy perspective, talking about a, a further extension there as well. So, you know. Um, he, they, he, he, did have, he did have the the Broncos fans booing him too as yeah. he's wearing their jersey. So just yeah. as like they, they've, they've suggested that when Ben Hunt next, next takes the field for the Dragons that the supporters might be booing him. But maybe as you're suggesting, they would do well to remember that... Uh, what the scenario was around Payne Haas because it did look for all money like he was out. He was out of there and the fans 
had completely turned on him and you just you would have thought to yourself well this isn't going to turn around like it well like it has eventually turned around now that would have been the last thing that i was expecting absolutely you know for um you know, he was a dollar one to go to the roosters at one point there so you know all is not lost st george fans but at the same time you know um in that particular scenario with Payne Haas, we are talking about the Broncos, who are a club that prop, uh, you know a little bit better resource than what the Dragons are, and have have the means and um, and uh, power to um, um, influence these decisions, probably a little better, and have a bit more bargaining power than what St George have. Um, however, you know, um, it could very well have been in, in in the case of Payne Haas, you know, to your point there, sixties that the media had had. Um, and um, exacerbated um, a problem to be much larger than it actually was. So, you know, um, again, without knowing the full details, we're obviously just speculating, but um, these situations have been saved from um, the proverbial um, cliff here, gents. So maybe there's some hope there for some uh, for St. George fans. Okay, let's, let's throw our hat into the ring here. You've got to give... Uh, I'm only after two words from you here at the most, right? Stays, goes, and if he goes, the name of the club that he goes to. 40, you're off, first cab off the rank. Oh, well, we talked about the Bulldogs. We talked about the Titans. Hang on, hang on. you're up to about 10 words. No, 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 but like, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm giving you the lead up for the two. I'm, yeah, I'm giving you the the, the the pre-roll for the two words, uh, but I feel like all roads lead to the Sydney Roosters. Okay, Clint goes Roosters for exactly those reasons. It's um this the, it uh, although I was uh, I was just suggesting before there might be a uh, a course for hope here for, for Dragons fans and for their sake I I do hope that that's the case. Um, this has all the smells of um, um, the Roosters having conversations behind the scenes here. And, you know, um, we speculated last week and, and you know, um, one of the questions you put to our 60s is whether we believe the Roosters would make the eight or not. Um, we spoke uh, in a little bit of detail about the half troubles that they're having there at the moment as well. Uh, they're not a club that tolerates um, us, um poor performance very long and they would absolutely be using leveraging speaking of well-resourced clubs um that can do something about it the roosters are the best in the business when it comes to that and um they would be pulling whatever levers they can um to try and influence any player who's going to add value to um to their organization to their playing outfits so um to me he goes and he goes to the roosters is is my tip okay i'll say stays there we go. Just to just to have a contrary point of view there. <laughs> okay. Now he's not the only high profile person a player rumored to be leaving. We've got Matt Lodge, who is evidently free to negotiate with clubs for an immediate release. What do you see playing out there, John? Well, six weeks ago I wouldn't have been surprised if we were linked to him if the same had happened, but a lot's changed since then, and Ogden and Makatoa and Moretti have all stepped up and really delivered. Uh, I mean, he was linked to the Bulldogs, I feel like, about a week ago as a 2024 addition. I think they've been linked to him and Tyrone May. So if he was you know, good good enough for 2024, you'd think, given their issues for the middle, because they've got a pack that is just getting bent over right now, um, that would take him right now. Yeah, Clint? Yeah, um... Jeez, he's, he's starting to go through a few clubs at the moment, Lodge. <laughs> yeah. And when the likes of the Roosters and um, and 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 the Broncos, and the uh, Warriors, you know, it's 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 um, it, 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 I'm not going to suggest it hasn't necessarily worked out, but you know, at the same time, if the Roosters want to keep you, they find a way. Um, so it, 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 it's 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 kind of I don't want to suggest damning in that, but. You know his um, his off field um, history is well recorded. You know he, for the most part, looks a reformed man in that side of his life. However, um, you know it's a few clubs he's going through right now. And if you'd asked me, um, and you put us in the position of um, six weeks ago, uh, 
all of this wouldn't be passing my own personal sniff test and it would be something that I, I, I wouldn't want to entertain. Um, yeah, and thank goodness we've, we've, we've been able to acquire the service of um, Joao Pangawe and, and also we've seen the um, emergence in form of the likes of Opiki Ogden, Makesi Makatoa and Luca Moretti. Um, but um, yeah, look, it's, it's very interesting to me the number of clubs that he's gone through there and it kind of suggests something. And is this the end of his um, subsidised um, salary from the Warriors? Has that maybe got anything to do with it? Or would he still be subsidised by the Warriors at the next club that he goes to? I think the Warriors have still keep paying. And then the Roosters would then have to broker what they would pay. Well, I suppose, has he, has he been... Oh, the terminology is important. Has he been given a, like a release from his current contract or is he still contracted free to negotiate somewhere else? In which case the legacy contract would need to then be brokered as to who was taking up which parts of the pro rata uh, left to pay out. So I, I you know what, know. you know what sounds good? The agents are going to have to earn yeah, money. The agents <laughs> finally, finally on their dosh and just a, a small one on the signings front boys, but it is relevant to the Parramatta Eels. Uh, indirectly, not not long term, but rather this week, uh, Josh Kerr got his immediate release from the Dragons to join the Dolphins, so he'll be actually taking part in the game on the weekend. Yeah, and, and a player of of um, I, I I've got a lot of time for Josh Kerr. I think he's he, he'll bring a lot of energy onto the field. He's coming off the bench, is he not? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, oh, he's a good engine room addition for the Dolphins. Um, clubs like to get their new recruits on the field against the Eels. <laughs> get back key players, yeah, get new recruits yeah. on the field. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, it comes out territory. We're also specials for a debutant to perform well, and of course the Dolphins have named a debutant as well. Uh, yes, with the winger. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. Um, but look, let's let's move away from the um i guess the the high profile uh mega rich players to one of rugby league's true battlers in alex (laughs) because his lone try has dominated rugby league social media ever since he pounced did he run 95 metres to pounce on that ball? He got the dirtiest, <laughs> dirtiest, <laughs> cheapest try he could have possibly have got. The uh, the botched knockback sort of uh, scoop up and score. But you know, they all count the same at the end, don't they? And well done to the big fella for, was it 117? 116? 116. 116. 116. Yeah, 116 NRL games in a row before he managed to plant one down and, and end the mother of all streaks there. You know what? I think the... The fact that it's such a good news story is the the smiles that it's brought to people's faces, no matter what club they support. It's a universally happy NRL supporter group that's seen Alex Twile get his first try and uh, yeah, full marks to the former Eels junior mm-hmm. in being able to finally cross for uh, the Tigers and... Um, yeah, I think that's that was probably well. It almost stole all the headlines out of the out of last week. If there wasn't the Ben Hunt scenario going on, it'd be Alex Twelve front pages everywhere. But talking about front page stories, Origin. So let's get into our final Origin thoughts with the the match taking place. Well, as we as we record. Tomorrow, as maybe a lot of people listening to this would be uh, finding uh, tonight (laughs) in their time. So, John, your final thoughts on Origin and the winner out of this game? Look, my tip is that Queens are going to be very, very difficult to beat. And I would love to see Mitchell Moses knock him over, but they've, they've set him up to fail, essentially, really. Uh, going up there to have to try and keep the series alive. So I, I think realistically Queensland probably win. I hope that Mitch plays an absolute blinder regardless. But if we don't win, uh, I think he'll still cop it deluxe. He could have a 10 out of 10 game, but people will find a way to needle him anyway. Uh, 
you know, we saw reports emerging today that Freddie Fittler has uh, figured out you're allowed to play wingers in their preferred club positions. Uh, Adokar and uh, Toto are set to swap, apparently, and go back to their actual natural wing spots, which is a good start. Uh, but, yeah, look, the New South Wales team, I think, is better on paper this... Well, in a way, better on paper, given who's available. Uh, but I still don't like all the selections. I, don't, I really don't like bench composition. Having one genuine middle on the bench is insane to me. Um, and yes, I know Payne Haas has a big motor and junior and whatnot can go big minutes, but we spoke about that in the past. So yeah, look, I hope the Eels boys have a blinder, uh, particularly for Mitch, because junior's got the tenure to, not, you know, if he has a, a mediocre game, it's whatever. But there's a lot in line here for Mitch for, you know, his legacy, I suppose, uh, for the way uh, he's evaluated by the general media and the general populace. But, you know, we know he's going to give it his all. Yeah, so what's your you you've indicated already you're going to take Queensland what's your score so for for the you know the heart dominating the the pick Moses leads New South Wales to a, a good victory uh you know 22 to sort of 16 but the head says Queensland and maybe Queensland by a couple of tries uh maybe like 26 to 14 yeah Clint uh, I see it unfolding in a very, very similar way here, Sixties. Um, I, I, I think John absolutely hit the nail on the head in, in many fronts there. And, you know, that, that there's, there's um, very little I disagree with exactly what he said. I'm, I'm really frustrated. I don't, and I've said this a couple of times now for, for our regular listeners. So I apologize. I'm repeating myself here. I'm really frustrated that Freddie has pulled me off um, um from the from the depth of not caring about origin to now caring, um, and um, and and uh, having to um, cheer on our boy who it feels like has been set up to fail, um, you know, and it, you can almost see the water cooler chat in offices around the um, the east coast of Australia on Thursday morning talking about why did they pick that Parramatta bloke. Um, you know, and these being casual fans who have no context into um, what a fantastic player Mitchell Moses um, has become and is. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not looking forward to, to to the possibility of that and the possibility of the the Twitter um, feed um, through throughout the game and and um, in the days that follow. Um, so, you know, the the thing that I I really really want to um, see. Is um is regardless of the result, Mitch go out there and absolutely give it his best, which I'm sure he absolutely will, um, regardless of whatever commentary may or may not exist around him and his performance. Um, but yeah, you look, it, it's it's hard to see anything other than a Queensland victory, and you know, um, being up there in Queensland, it's it's near mission impossible for for this Blues side. They're really going to have to pull a performance, um, you know, of of, of the upper tier to upset Queensland here. But, you know, um, I, I, I really, really do hope um, that uh, some of my fears here are unrealised and um, I get proven completely wrong. Mish goes out there, brains them, and, um, and stands his name in origin folklore. Um, but at this point, like, like John suggested, I, I see uh, probably a two-try victory to Queensland in this one. Again, in the vicinity of a mid to high twenties to um, to a, a, a low teens scoreline, you know, like a twenty eight fourteen type of scoreline. Yeah, well, like you two fellas, I've been taken from. Uh, well, my emotional investment in a New South Wales win has gone up a notch or two now with a couple of the Eels players in the team. I'm, you know, I I didn't rate our chances at all up until the Moses selection. And the more I've thought about it, I'm convincing myself that <laughs> that, that the composure that Mitch has been showing in season 2023 is exactly what the New South Wales team needs because it seems to me that where Nathan Cleary is... is letting himself down at origin level is composure. He looks out there at that level of football. He looks rushed in a way that you don't see in club football. Now, I understand that obviously 
origin football is next level up. And don't get me wrong, Cleary has performed quite well in in some origin games. But when all's said and done, when you when you take it across the breadth of his origin experience, he hasn't measured up. Now, does that mean you shouldn't select Nathan Cleary uh, in the future? No, not at all. I mean, if, if you use origin as a reward for the best player uh, and the most consistent player in a position in the in the NRL Premiership, well, that goes to Cleary hands down because that's who he has been leading Penrith to back-to-back Premierships. But, yeah, he's, he's looked flustered. He's looked frustrated in origin football. And maybe it's just that my mind is is thinking about how he's looked in our losses where he's appeared that way. I just think maybe, just maybe, Mitch Moses is going to have that maturity to guide the Blues to a better performance. It, it may help to lift some of the players around him as well. Um, you know, maybe they'll see it as a... as not so much missing a player as as having something different in the team, and I'm going to tip I'm going to tip New South Wales to win this, and I'll flip what you've given as your predictions, and I'll make it uh, twenty eight fourteen to the Blues over the Cane Toads. So, fellas, now that just leaves one more match to preview. And that's the women's origin match. We've talked about this in the past. Where's the publicity around it? Mm-hmm. Where's the promo? Like, if they've got some, great, they've got some great advertising material to draw upon with the past games. Great hits, great tries. You know, intense play, and uh, yet yeah, there's complete radio and television and online silence. It, it is mind-boggling, and, you know, it's impressive to the girls uh, that they generate enough buzz from just, like, the foot traffic and the, the core audience that gets out there to watch the game, uh, the one that took place at Combank, obviously, and the one that will take place up at, uh, uh, I forget what the, the, Darwin, the Darwin, the Townsville Stadium's called, but up there. Um, Queensland Country Bank. Queensland Country Bank, there you go. I always think of 100 Smiles or 1-300 Smiles, what it, what it <laughs> used to be before they built the new one. Um, yeah, it, it is criminal. You know, the NRLW and, you know, NRLW State of Origin have been such incredible products for the game, and yet here we are not hyping it whatsoever. Like, do you, is it, does it have anything to do with the fact that it's not in season, an in-season match for the NRLW? Because I've got my thoughts on that as well, and as to whether the timing of it is ideal. I know that the, the women have their Harvey Norman... Uh, women's premiership and the um, I'm not sure what the equivalent is up in Queensland but they're they're not in the middle of their premiership should the women's origin be played should it should it be shifted away from the men's origin and be staged during the women's premiership I mean the I mean there's always the argument that it's an interruption to the the men's premiership and people would prefer it at the end of the season. But can you imagine if the if the men's state of origin was played as a preseason match? The problem like, is- like, like people, people would find that outrageous. And yet that's that's how the women are playing it. They're playing it yeah. as preseason matches. Exactly. And, and the problem is with that line, not not your line of thought, but the hypothetical line of thought where you do you need to move the women's origin to be later in the season to be its own standalone thing during their NRLW regular season is that it works in the short term, but eventually you've got to think that the plan is for the NRLW to be matched across the season with the NRL, you know, yeah. the, to be running parallel to it so they've got more slots to broadcast, more things to, you know, sell the game for. And at that point, you know, what are you going to make the women play their highest level representative play before their finals and burn them out even more? Like the, the whole point of Origin being in the mid-season – as opposed to being postseason, I suppose being the the alternative. But you can't do it anywhere else in the season because you need the players the players need time to recover to get back. Yes. You know. So what I'm suggesting is that their their scheduling for the time being becomes a bit more flexible, so that, that you know when when the time comes that they've got a longer premiership season, 
that it comes back and aligns in with the the men's. But I think for the time being, right now, when it with when it's being staged, I don't believe the matches themselves. I believe the matches themselves could be even better because the women will be in some sort of premiership form if it was being played during their season rather than in their pre-season. So, yeah, no, uh, it, 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 it's an important discussion. Yeah, I, look, I, I mean, I think it, it's it's like when people I've had people suggest to me that the money that's being paid to the women is is not that they haven't the the women's game hasn't earned it because they don't bring in the ratings, they don't bring in the crowds, they don't bring in the corporate support, all all that sort of stuff. And my argument with that is you cannot grow a game, a professional game, without investing in it right now. And the money that's being paid, which is, I mean, it's not as if it's it's um, mind-blowing coin that the women's game is being played, but they're, it's, it's improving. But the money that's being paid to the women right now is an investment in the future of the code to attract women uh, the top women athletes to stay in the game or to maybe look at the NRLW as a as an option for their football career. And at, at a point in the future, it will be generating the ratings, the revenue. Maybe it might not ever get to the NRL level, but it will it will improve what it's able to generate now. But you have to invest. It's like any product. If you've got a new product, you have to invest in promotion. You have to invest in the marketing of it. There's, you know, there's got to be a lead in before there's genuine profit that's um, that's generated. And and for a code, an entire code, it's going to take a bit longer. So I, I just see you have to look at ways that it can be better. And I'm not sure that staging it as in their preseason is the best option. But um, let's that's probably for. Uh, another time as a discussion, but let's um, let's get into our tips for this, uh, John. So, what are you what are you seeing as the outcome here? So, New South Wales need to win by nine points differential in order to claim the the trophy outright. If they win by eight points, it goes to a string of tiebreaker scenarios, including uh, who scored the most tries across the two games. So, you don't want to be you know leaving it up to that. Um, I, I'm going to predict New South Wales to bounce back here. And uh, I'll go for a 10-point victory uh, in the vicinity of maybe 20 to 10. Yep. Clint? Um, yeah, I see New South Wales uh, returning serve in this one and getting over. Um, just on, on those um, scenarios there, John, as well, um, in the event um, in the first uh, women's origin game, it was four tries to two. Um, with only um, one goal kick from the Queensland side in the 18-10 victory. So um, it's the, the, the draw scenario certainly favours the Queensland side still there. Um, so it's going to have to be t- a 10-point um, victory or more. And I, I think the girls can go up there and get the job done. And I'm looking somewhere in the vicinity of um, five tries to three. I'll, so I'll, I'll call that a, tw- a 28-16 victory there. Mate, you've actually just stolen my scoreline. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a twelve-point scoreline. I think that the New South Wales team will be better for that run. I think they've got a bit more improvement in them than uh, the Queenslanders do. We'll be cheering on our girl Kennedy Cherrington. T- can we say TCT Zone Kennedy Cherrington? I'd like to call her TCT Zone Kennedy Cherrington, <laughs> given given that. Um, yeah, she's she's our she's our girl out there, and uh, we're backing her to lead the Blues to a twelve point win and be able to celebrate uh, women's the first women's Origin series victory. So that's uh, we'll call that history making, won't we? The first women's absolutely, win. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, fellas, how, how have we gone for time this? Uh, this episode, John, we must be just over the hour, are we? Hour 15, believe it or not. There is no doubt. There is no doubt even uh, you're no always, matter what the podcast always is. You always bank on golden point when it comes to the tip sheet. 
so fellas thank you very much for uh another great episode thank you to our sponsors uh big swing golf north mead and star partners real estate auburn norellan Parramatta. as we always say without without such generous support we just wouldn't be able to produce what we do for our eels supporters and Thank you to all of you for tuning in and having a listen to us on the Tip Sheet podcast. We'll be back with our preview podcast in a couple of days. Until then, go you wheels.